All right, let's jump into the fourth and fifth phrases of the uh, Bach C major prelude. Uh, so right here on the screen, we're starting with the, um, the G7 chord that you see in measure 24. So let's just jump in and label it. So this right there is a G7 chord. And if you just isolate, here we can highlight this in yellow. Uh, if you just isolate from the bottom going up, you have the notes G, F, G, B, and D. And then of course they repeat the same way. So it's this sound right here of the G7, G, F, G, B, D. And the way that it's constructed in the actual music at the surface, it sounds like this. curious progression ensues because as you can see in the next measure the G in the bass stays put in fact the G repeats multiple times throughout this phrase but if you look at the notes in measure 25 it's G up to now E and then G C and E so let's label that chord uh, this looks like a lot like C E and G over G so this is a C major triad in second inversion but it's still understood as a dominant function so let's go back to measure 24 and label this in the context of the C major scale or C Ionian scale so this is a 5-7 chord now what's really important to note here is how the voice leading functions so we're gonna spell out all of the intervals above the given bass in measure 24 so it's a seventh of course that's the F and then the other two notes of the uh, of the seventh chord are the fifth above and the third above and let's just observe what happens so let's start with that seventh do you notice that this F right here migrates down a step by the next measure to E so this becomes a 7 dash 6 now the fifth above G in measure 24 is the highest note which I'm going to circle right now D and in the very same location, that is on the onset of beat number two, in the treble clef, that D moves up a step to E. So that is a fifth that also progresses up a step to a sixth. And then finally, the third in measure 24 above the bass note G, which is a B, which I'll circle now, that B in the same location, you know, metrically, uh, becomes a C, which means that that third progresses up a step to a fourth. All right, so if we just reduce this to block chords, the first measure is G7, and then the second measure is C over G. Now, why did I say that this still carries a dominant function? You would think that when you hear a C major chord in the context of C, it must be a tonic chord. Well, in terms of its label, yeah, it's a tonic triad in second inversion. But in terms of its contextual function, it's actually a dominant. So hold that thought for a moment as, as, as to what the explanation is. Let's keep going and just observe what happens to the voice leading as we progress. So let's go over to the next measure, that's measure 26. And again, highlighting the notes as we've been doing from the bass on up, we have G up to D, and then G, C, and finally F. So let's take a look at the voice leading to figure out what this is before we put a proper label over it. So let's start with the seventh going to the sixth that we observed um, in the upper part of the bass clef. So specifically, I'm referring to this melodic line, uh, the F3 right there, that then progresses in measure 24 down to measure 23 to um, <clears throat> E3. And that, that in turn progresses in measure 26 down to D3. So the line here is that becomes a fifth. Now, I can write it here, but then something curious happens. Let's check on the highest note and its melodic progression through these three measures. So look at measure 24 again, and the onset of beat two, I'm gonna put an arrow right there, that's D4. It progresses up to E4 in measure 25, and then up to F4 right there in measure 26. So the line there is five in 24, 
a fifth above the base, up to sixth, and then, and then up to seven in measure 26. Now the reason that's kind of unusual is because typically when you're writing out figures, you want to write the highest figure on top and then progress downward. So in this case, we need to kind of swap places. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show the following. So a kind of arrow from sixth leading up this way, and then an arrow from the highest six leading down that way so that you can see that that sixth in turn does actually resolve down to five. Okay, so it's, it's just a little swapping of places to maintain the, uh, the graphical design of the numbers so that the figures are in descending order from highest down. So seven, five, and then let's take a look at that fourth. So looking at measure 25, I'm looking at C4 on the last 16th of beat number one. There it is, I just put an arrow there. And that C, as you can see, no pun intended, uh, stays exactly where it had been. So that fourth doesn't change, so I'm just gonna draw a dash, and here we have this. Now, what triad or seventh chord do we know that has both a fifth as well as a fourth? Well, none, right? In this particular system, you can't have triadic spelling that includes a fourth. So unless you have some sort of seventh chord in inversion, as you know, uh, but this clearly isn't it because this really amounts to a G dominant seventh chord, which sounds like this, but it's missing its third, and that third, the B, is substituted for a fourth. So this fourth really doesn't belong. It's a non-chord tone and this is what's known as a suspension. That C is being suspended, carried over from measure 25 before it ultimately resolves. So as far as the label goes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this a G7 chord, which is what it is, with a suspended fourth. So it's just a G7 sus, as you can see above the staff. Let's keep track of the voice leading. So going down to the next system, measure 27, we have uh, the notes from the bass going up are G, D, G, B, and F. And now as far as the voice leaning goes, well, let's track it. So the seventh, which you know is in the uppermost voice in measure 26, maintains, right? That doesn't change, so we still have a seven. The fifth, which is the D, uh, D3, that's in the bass clef, that stays exactly the same in measure 27, so that hasn't changed. And the only thing that does actually move is that suspended C that's been prepared in measure 25, suspended in measure 26, and then finally resolved in measure 27. So that C steps down to B, and so we can indicate that with a dash three. Let me make that a little better, dash three. All right, so now if you look at this chord, 753, this is exactly how we started this segment of phrase four in measure 24. All that's happened is we've kind of reworked the voices so that the F, here I'll highlight this with a different color so you can see it. Uh, the F, uh, let's see, let's use green. Uh, the F in measure 24, this F3, has migrated, right? We've had an octave displacement and it's moved up to F4 in measure 27, there it is. And then the other note, the D that was at the top of measure 24, D4, highlighted in green again, has been displaced down an octave or transposed down an octave uh, in measure 27 with D3 on the second 16th note of the measure. So all that's happened is we've just maneuvered the voices around. So the entire progression sounds like this. If we play it as reduced block chords. The first measure sounds like this. 24, 25, 26, 27. Okay, so it's just this gradual slinking of voices so that we get, here I'll play the whole thing as written. 
can hear that really these four measures can be summarized as a prolongation of the dominant seventh harmony. That's really all that's going on here. So as far as measure 25 is concerned, where you see the C over G, hopefully this is a more convincing argument than just me saying that this is a dominant function chord that looks like a C major chord in second inversion. In other words, it looks like a tonic over its fifth, tonic over dominant, but the function is part of a prolongation of the dominant harmony. So that's all well and good, and let's just take a look at this um, in reduced format outside of the score. So going over here, you can see that we have the same chords. Look at the first four chords, and here it's a little bit easier in this fashion just to trace what's happening. So as far as the labels go, again, we start with a 5-7, five, 5-3. Five, we progress to a 6, 6, and of course 3. I mean, <laughs> four, six, six, four, because a six, four, after all, is a second inversion triad. Sorry, I got, I was thinking ahead a little bit. And then you remember that we swap those places. This six moves down to this five. That six moves up to seven. This four stays, and then that C drops, and so then we have three, right? And everything else stays the same. So that is a kind of shorthand for what I was just playing. And as far as the labels up on top, again, just for review, we start with a G7, a C over G, a G7 with a suspended fourth, and then the fourth resolves, and we have just a G7. And those are the first four measures there, uh, starting with, uh, as I was saying, measure 24. Okay, so let me just make sure that that's correct, measure 24 right uh, now the next chord is interesting so let's jump back to the music and uh, take a look at what's happening so here is measure 28 I'm gonna label it so you immediately see where see where it is that's the second measure of the second system and reading the notes from the bottom to top highlight in yellow look like this G E flat a C F sharp okay playing those notes G in the bass E flat A C F sharp kind of let that dissonance uh, sink in so what is this chord well when you try to rearrange the notes so that they look like stacked thirds because that's what triadic uh, harmony does including its extensions beyond the fifth seventh ninth eleventh thirteenth and so on um, well those are all the extensions uh, this would look like F sharp a C E flat and then G so that would be an F sharp fully diminished seventh chord plus a ninth and it's a nice crunchy dissonance but this would be uncharacteristic for Bach's era or specifically for Bach to have this kind of ninth chord behaving functionally so there's something else going on here, and in order to understand this, we have to kind of grasp the larger context. The larger context is the bass has not been moving at all. When the bass, when the bass doesn't move, this is called a pedal point, like a PP, a pedal point. So in this case, we have a dominant pedal, which is just a reoccurring or uh, sustained note somewhere in the texture. It tends to be in the bass, although it doesn't have to be. So this is a dominant pedal sustained in the bass, and sometimes that dominant pedal is part of the harmony, as we see in measures 24 through 27, and sometimes it isn't. In measure 28, it is not part of the chord. So if you eliminate the G, as we've already described, this is an F sharp fully diminished seventh chord, where its lowest chord tone is E flat. So we kind of have to separate it out like this, right? These are the actual notes of the chord. So this is an F sharp, fully diminished seventh over E flat. And by the way, let's just not forget to include the label for measure 27, one bar earlier. So that's just a G7 chord again. All right, so F sharp, fully diminished seventh over E flat and we have to account for the fact that there is a pedal here, so we're just gonna write another over, another slash, over G. 
Now, what does this mean in terms of functional harmony? How do we understand this using Roman numerals and uh, figures? So as witnessed earlier in this piece, it is possible to have secondary chords. So this chord, this F sharp fully diminished seventh, it doesn't belong to the key of C, but it does belong to the key of G. And I know that because if you recall, fully diminished seventh chords, that's our F sharp fully diminished seventh chord, the root of the chord, in this case F sharp, is the leading tone in its tonic. So the leading tone is a semitone below the tonic. So a semitone above F sharp to which it would resolve is G. Okay, so this chord is modifying its strengthening as a dominant substitute because remember sevens are substitutes of five chords. They both function as dominants. So this is a seven here. Let's write this down to seven fully diminished seventh chord over its third, uh, I'm sorry, over the, not over its third, over its seventh, what I was thinking of is the third tone above the root, but that's, never mind, that's neither here nor there. So it's a seven chord in third inversion, because it's over its seventh, which as you know is 4-2, and in this case it's modifying or strengthening or tonicizing G, which is the dominant in the key of C, so it's a seven fully diminished, 4-2, of 5, and then don't forget that it's over the dominant pedal, which in this case we just write as DP, meaning dominant pedal, okay? Or director of photography if for some reason you're thinking about film, but that's a dumb joke, I'll try to refrain from that. So again, fully diminished seventh chord over the dominant bass. And it creates a really nice conflict of sorts, right? This really massive dissonance. But we know that the dissonance is in service of driving the harmony forward, the progression forward. So it becomes kind of a momentary interruption because what follows measure 28 are chords that are practically identical to what we saw in measures 24 through 27. So let's take a look. So going to the next screen, here is that, again, sort of mysterious chord. This is that F sharp, fully diminished seventh, over E flat, over G, which we already know to label as a seven, fully diminished, four two, of five, over dominant pedal. And observe that in terms of voice leading, look at the uppermost note. So I'm gonna highlight the F sharp, that's at the top of the texture. And this serves as a kind of chromatic passing tone between this F, right, that's the G7 chord, that's its seventh, and then that F continuing through the F sharp to G. And once we reach that G, notice how we have a kind of progression downward of the soprano note, the uppermost note, because from that G, the next two chords have the descent by step from G down to F, and let's just take a look at what happens. So looking at this page now, before we go back to the score, this chord is a C over G, right? You can observe the notes, so we have G in the bass, E natural, G, C, G, all right, so that's clearly just like the second chord um, at the beginning of the phrase on this page, just like this chord, that is a C over G. Although you'll notice that again, it's just somewhat respelled, right? The notes are arranged differently, but they're the same notes. C over G, and then in the next chord, it looks just like the G7 with a sus. So look at the voice leading here. So we have G, up to D, and then G and C and F as you read from the bass on up. So that is a G7 chord with the suspension, right? Do you see the suspension right there? I'm gonna indicate it as a tied note right there. So that's our G7 sus. And then the very last chord is simply a G7 chord, just like the end of the first half of this phrase where I just put the arrow. So that is our 5-7 chord. So as far as the labels go, here we just have to look at the voice leading again. So what we have is looking at the, uh, let's go from this spot right there. So the 7th 
right there. We're going to pretend that we just skipped that F sharp fully diminished seventh chord. It goes up a step to an octave. And then the fifth, which is in the bass, right, that D3, it steps through the E flat to E natural, and that goes up to a sixth above the bass G. And then the third, which is the B, uh, the B3 in the treble, that moves up a step to C, and that becomes a fourth. So from this point, observe how the voice leading operates. The octave steps down to a seventh and stays there. The sixth in the bass, right, that's E3, steps down to a fifth and stays there. And then the fourth stays through the G7 as a suspension and then finally resolves down a step to B3 in the treble to a third. So if you look at the entirety of this progression with how many chords do we have here? Four in the first measure of the reduction, then one measure for the F-sharp fully diminished seventh, and then three others. That's a total of eight individual chords where seven of them, right, these four right here, plus these three right here, are dedicated entirely to a prolongation of the dominant harmony, of the G7 harmony. So the question really becomes, what is this chord doing there? Well, it's kind of a chromatic interruption, and it serves the singular purpose of connecting the first round of sort of G7 manipulation to the second round of dominant prolongation through the manipulation of the voice leading as already described. So listen to how powerful this progression is. Um, I'm gonna play it first as a reduction, exactly as you see on the screen. So from the beginning, right? So right from measure 24, it sounds like this. There's a lot of stress in that. There's a lot of uh, built building up of kind of anticipation because the more we hear that dominant pedal, the more we want it to resolve to the tonic. Remember that that is the basic semantic function of tonality, to build up tension away from the tonic in order for the tonic, once it arrives, to sound ever more convincing as an arrival point. So what Bach is doing here is successfully building the tension through all of the inner voices and the upper voices as they move, essentially by step, in some cases chromatically, over a fixed, pedal point in the bass, that entire dominant pedal prolongation through all of these measures. Now listen to what it sounds like when you listen to it as a piece of uh, living music, not just this reduction. So going back, um, I'm going to have to kind of skim over here, but uh, so it's we're looking at this screen and then the next half is this material. I'm going to highlight it right there in measure 30 and then in measure 31 and that's where this phrase comes to a close so just to put labels on the stuff before I play it here's what I'm looking at so going back to measure 29 at the end of the screen we have our C over G right remember that is our 5 and then we have our 8 right the octave and then the 6 and of course the 4 and then skipping a screen we continue in the key of C, of course, and then we have our G7 sus, and that is our five again, with the seventh, the fifth, and the fourth, and then finally in measure 31, right there, the seventh stays, the fifth stays, and the fourth resolves to a third. So all of that is just part of that dominant prolongation, and we reach G7. So here's what all of that sounds like. So I'm not going to flip through the screen, but you will be able to hear it. So going back to measure 24, here's what the texture of the music sounds like in real time. <laughs> 
want that resolution to the tonic, you are absolutely right. But that is the last phrase of the piece. And what Bach does is truly remarkable in, again, preventing the feeling of complete satisfaction. So we can't really get satisfaction in this piece, not just yet. And that's what drives the music continuously forward. So looking at what we have before we uh, move on to the next phrase, remember that all of this is just a large scale dominant prolongation interrupted by this really fascinating secondary chord. That's this chord right here, the seven fully diminished seventh of G or the F sharp fully diminished seventh. Um, and this is again what's called a secondary leading leading tone chord or leading tone in this case seventh chord. Now don't get overwhelmed with the vocabulary. Remember that a leading tone chord, a seven chord, is a substitute for the dominant. So it carries a dominant function just like a five chord. So I know I'm reiterating, but this is important just for you to understand. It's a secondary chord because its primary equivalent would be the triads and seventh chords that belong to the original scale, that is to the C scale. So in the key of C, the seven chord is certainly not F sharp. In the key of C, the seventh chord is a B diminished triad or a B half diminished triad, that's B, D, F, A. If you want to use modal mixture and borrow the A flat from C minor, the parallel minor, then you've got B fully diminished seventh. But either way, that's a primary chord belonging to the primary key. When we're borrowing or taking from another key, in this case, we're borrowing from G, right? Its seven chord is F sharp diminished. And again, if it's all diatonic belonging to G major, it's going to be F sharp, A, C, and E natural. If we borrow the E flat from G minor, then it's going to be F sharp, A, C, E flat. And so we move from a half diminished to a fully diminished seventh. But either way, that's a secondary chord because it belongs to a secondary key. And all in all, what it's doing is tonicizing the G chord, right? So this 7-7 seven, seven of 5 just means that temporarily we are creating a tonic out of a chord other than our primary tonic. So we're tonicizing the 5 chord. And the effect that it has is it simply strengthens the pull toward the dominant that follows from this measure. That is from measure uh, 28. Right, so that's why you feel that um, you, you feel that strength as the F sharp full diminished over E flat over G progresses to C over G, and then the suspension, of course, and the resolution. So this is all part of a larger schema to keep the progression moving forward with a high degree of tension. So let's pause there and we'll continue in another video uh, for the last phrase and then sum up these final two phrases, uh, phrases four and five in the Bach prelude.